When we talk about the self-portrait we immediately think of Rembrandt, the Dutch painter of the Golden Age. During his career as a painter, Rembrandt made almost a hundred self-portraits in different forms, more than any other artist of his time, and later. Over forty paintings, thirty-one etchings and seven drawings. For some of these works, the identity of either the subject or the artist is uncertain, while some cannot be identified as portraits by the definition of this genre. This was an enormously high number for any artist up of that time and later, around 10% of his oeuvre in both painting and etching. By comparison, the highly prolific Rubens produced only seven self-portrait paintings. Other artists, in the history of art, have most often contented themselves with a few works of this kind of painting. It is not known why Rembrandt produced such a large number of self-portraits, he never spoke about it. This form of artistic expression attracted Rembrandt from his debut as a painter in 1625, when he was 19, until his death in 1669. Throughout his life, Rembrandt made portraits where he showed himself with different gestures and facial expressions, various emotional states, and in different roles. Especially at the beginning of his career. It seems as if his different expressions are the result of Rembrandt's experimental research. Through his self-portraits, he also demonstrates his vast knowledge of the history of art, of its masters and its rules. In his technique, he was influenced by Titian and Raphael, and in composition, by the old masters of the north of the 16th century. He appropriated the poses and fashionable clothes of that time, something he did not depart from throughout his career, like his emblematic beret. Rembrandt's self-representations can be divided into three groups. In the first group, Rembrandt does not paint himself alone, but introduces his face among other figures in historical or biblical scenes. This practice is limited to the early years of Rembrandt's career when he was looking for a way to assert himself during the era of Rubens' domination. Looking at these paintings, one cannot help admiring Rembrandt's ingenuity and a certain sense of humor. In the second group, including mainly some thirty etchings, produced during the first half of his career, he often uses his face and figure for studies. These are mostly informal and often playful studies of grimacing facial expressions or portraits with disguises. In many of them, he is wearing fashionable clothes from a century or more ago, where he pays homage to the painters who inspired him. When, in 1631, the English diplomat Robert Kerr acquired, on the recommendation of the Dutch statesman Constantin Huygens, the self-portrait with a beret and a gold chain, and offered it to King Charles I, it gave an international status to Rembrandt, who was only 25 then. Thus, from the start of his career, this self-portrait was part of the King of England's collection, alongside other self-portraits of renowned artists such as Peter Paul Rubens and Antoine van Dyck who worked at the court. Once he became famous, 
Rembrandt concentrated more and more on the study of himself while continuing to develop his technique mastery and the search for light and chiaroscuro. A very important element in self-portraits. The technique of impasto, the treatment of color, light and space are the main reasons for the success of this artist's work, and therefore of his self-portraits. The third group of self-portraits by Rembrandt includes those works in which he is the sole subject of his artistic preoccupation at different times in his life. The majority are oil paintings and only four etchings can be considered true self-portraits. In these self-portraits the costumes or the poses can have symbolic values, but they gradually fade away before the pitiless realism of the painter's self-analysis. His oil paintings trace the progress from an uncertain young man, through the dapper and very successful portrait painter of the 1630s, to the troubled but massively powerful portraits of his old age. From a young man with rebellious hair, he gains confidence over time and presents himself in the end as a sage or as a decrepit old man, worn down by the avatars of his life, mourning, ruin. The multiplicity of his self-portraits allows the viewer to read a true diary, we see him expressing various moods of the moment, dressing up and aging. Rembrandt's self-portraits from the last period of his life strike us with the truth in his eyes looking at his own life. In his last and most powerful self-portraits, his view speaks of the death of his three children, the death of his beloved wife, bankruptcy, debts and legal troubles of a misunderstood solitary. Together they give a remarkably clear picture of the man, his appearance and his psychological makeup, as revealed by his richly weathered face. To Kenneth Clark, Rembrandt is, with the possible exception of Van Gogh, the only artist who has made the self-portrait a major means of artistic self-expression. And he is absolutely the one who has turned self-portraiture into an autobiography. Rembrandt's self-portraits are among the most coveted works of art in museums around the world today.